At this time, I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Kopp, President of Marshall University, uh, to give the opening address. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Marshall University, those of you, of you that came from outside. It's great to have you here this morning. Many thanks to our sponsors for helping make this event possible, and it is truly an outstanding event. We have many distinguished people in the audience. I saw Mayor Wolf is here today. Welcome, Mayor as well as uh, our keynote speaker, Selby Wellman, who is a graduate of Marshall University. And Selby, we're great to have you. it's great to have you back here. Today's conference, in many ways, is the culmination and celebration of a transformative vision for the future developed some five years ago at the dawning of what we're describing as a new age here at Marshall University. Our goal for this event is to showcase and promote various elements of Marshall's emerging cyber infrastructure, not only for those of you involved in the academic community throughout the state and the region, but also for community members to understand what this capacity means and can mean for you and uh, the things that you're involved in. This capacity includes high performance computing, advanced visualization, high speed networking, large data storage, geospatial data capture, and other emerging capabilities as resources that can help catalyze future development and growth throughout our state and region. To put it simply, the cyber infrastructure development that has been achieved here at Marshall University means that we can do anything and support anything that research and development requires. And that's a very bold statement, and I'm sure Jan Fox will make sure that happens. When I first met Jan Fox in July of 2005, one of the first questions I asked her was, is Marshall University connected to Internet 2? And she told me no. And I asked her why not. And she gave me a very extensive uh, explanation. It was very sound. And we talked about the importance of Internet 2 connectivity for Marshall University and the future of everything that we were envisioning for the future of this university and this region. And we set out as a priority to ensure that we would have that capacity because without that connectivity and without that capacity, we were going to be left behind at least one or two generations in our competitive ability for research, for academic development, and for the overall development of this university. We also understood the importance of the enhanced capacity and capabilities and speed that was necessary to handle the impending digital data deluge, especially in the types of research development that we forecasted was on the near horizon and areas of opportunity for this great university. In my opinion, I don't think we missed that mark in any respect. And as we look at the timeline, and I think Dr. Fox will share that with you today, you can see the progression of the development. It has been very intentional, very systematic, and very focused on the capabilities, not just for the research enterprise here at Marshall University, but for the capabilities that we forecasted would be needed to transform the state of West Virginia and this region of West Virginia into a very, very competitive engine for not only the development of this university, but the new economy throughout the state. When you look at the remarkable progress that has been achieved, it requires high-level champions and a dedicated expert architect and champion who can transform and lead a complex vision into reality. That visionary architect champion has been Dr. Jan Fox here at Marshall University. Further inspiration has been provided by many co-visionary application intensivists, I like to call them, 
like Dr. Tony Swilsky. And in conversations with Dr. Swilsky, we talked about what visualization technology and simulation technology could do for the benefit of our students and for the benefits of our research enterprise. And you'll see the culmination of some of that work in his presentation today. As we look at the frontiers of what's been established, those of you in the audience today that will be presenters, it's very clear you have embraced the future and established beachheads on the frontiers of the world of possibilities. You have catalyzed and accelerated, accelerated the development that we saw in the future through your very hard work and dedication. You will hear about a number of these advances here today. We are witnessing the manifestation and expression of this vision in multiple forms. Whether we look at the Marshall Institute of Inter for Interdisciplinary Research, our Center for Nano uh, Diagnostic Nanosystems, our Nanotechnology and Nanomachine Laboratories, and our Advanced Visualization Simulation Laboratories, to name a few, you can begin to comprehend the enormous capabilities and capacities we now have at the fingertips of people on this campus and our partners across the world. These initiatives are blossoming into very constructive and productive collaborations, not just across the state here in West Virginia, but across the nation and throughout the world. And it's instantaneous because of the high speed capacities that we're talking about. To put it in perspective, if you use conventional download network connections, a two-hour video download will take you hours to download. On the internet, too, it takes you six seconds or less. And when you're working with large terabyte data sets and you require very complex and memory-intensive software that is housed in the cloud and not on any campus, and you want to be able to interface and do research or computational analysis or analytical work, you can do it in real time through the capabilities we have now. So as you look at cyber infrastructure and think about it in terms of what does it mean, it literally equates to e-everything, the capacity to do anything in digital frameworks through accelerated transmission and, and uh, speed. And for some of us, even sitting at our computers for six seconds is too long. And no doubt we're going to see that compress as time goes on. So we are living in a world now where imagination becomes the new reality. It's just a matter of how do we get there. And for our faculty, for the faculties across the institutions here in the state, we're now at the cusp of a new age when Im imagination takes form in real applications that benefit our students, benefit our constituents, benefit our business community, and benefit the citizens all across the state if we commit to making that future the reality. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about data collection, data set integration, multi-layer analysis of complex data sets derived from multiple sources, to derive new intelligence and new applications and new discoveries. We now have the capability, unli almost unlimited capability. And now the frontier is the frontier of the human mind and our creativity and innovation and inventiveness to see opportunity, to see possibility, and make it a reality. 
We have worked very hard, many people have, to make this day-to-day -day possible. But I think it's important to amplify this is but the beginning. The commitment of all of us working together in partnership will make these new possibilities possible. It's no longer prudent or appropriate for institutions of higher learning to conceive of themselves as independent operators operating exclusively for their own benefit to the exclusion of everyone else. That's what collaboration means. In an increasingly resource-limited world, it is absolutely incumbent upon everyone to pull together to realize that far more is gained through collaboration and partnership than trying to create exclusive rights limited to the few. We've lived through that world, and it's not a very good world because it creates the haves and the have-nots. We at Marshall University have been very committed to embracing broad-based collaboration and partnership for the benefit of all, not to the exclusion of the many. And that philosophy and belief structure will persist. Whether it's a matter of creating connections between our healthcare systems and our patients, or whether it's creating connections through our K through 12 schools with these capabilities, we are committed to seeing that happen to the advantage of all. It will take some time and a lot of dedicated effort and work, but that commitment has been bona fide and real and will continue. And that is our pledge to everyone here. Tomorrow is now today at Marshall University, and I'm exceedingly proud. For everybody here today, welcome to the future. Thank you very much. Many may be aware that, um, that Dr. and Mrs. Cobb recently uh, received this, uh, the Herald Dispatch Citizens of the Year Award, and I think that was well on. And thanks. <clears throat> we always have a wall, warm welcome for uh, Dr. Paul Hill. Um, as many of you know, Paul is the Vice Chancellor for Research uh, <clears throat> for Science and Research with the West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission. Uh, he's also the Executive Director of the uh, West Virginia EPSCO program. Uh, in addition to that, he is the State Principal Investigator of the Cyber Infrastructure Project. And of course, as Dr. Kopp mentioned, uh, Paul is an alumni of, of Marshall. So, Paul. Thank you, Tony, and good morning to all of you. Um, on behalf of the State of West Virginia, the Higher Education Policy Commission, and the National Science Foundation, uh, I'm really pleased to be a co-sponsor of this event today. I think uh, what is happening here, I want to certainly recognize Marshall University for all the hard work that you've put into this event to make it truly transformative. Uh, I use that word very deliberately because I think, as Dr. Kopp just uh, indicated, that this is a transformative event for us in the state of West Virginia. I want to take a moment uh, just to, uh, I, I can't help myself, but when I was a student here in the 70s, and showing my age a little bit, this was a bowling alley. Talk about transformative. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is remarkable. About here in the front of the stage is where the uh, the 10 pin was that I seem to have never been able to hit, but uh, I spent far too much time in the science building to be very good at bowling. But this was, uh, this was a brand new facility back then and uh, brings back wonderful memories just to be here today uh, to share a little bit of that with you. But for research to be truly transformative, 
it must cross um, institutional, state, and even international lines. We, we must look at it that way. And cyber infrastructure makes that possible. Now, in recent years, uh, the state of West Virginia has, has really made some tremendous strides toward building a strong cyber infrastructure that supports data-intensive research that is being conducted right here on our campuses and at other campuses throughout the state of West Virginia. In 2009, the National Science Foundation awarded West Virginia EPSCoR a $2.6 million uh, project called CI Train, which stands for Cyber Infrastructure for Transformational Scientific Discovery. This is a collaboration between the West Virginia higher education system and the University of Arkansas system. As a requirement of this particular grant program, it required that we uh, reform consortia of two or more states around the country, and Arkansas has been a delightful partner in this process. This collaboration um, is really connecting our institutions with high performance computing networks and allowing our researchers to collaborate in real time without restraint of geographic distribution. Last year, the West Virginia EPSCoR program received nearly $1.2 million in uh, ERA funds through the National Science Foundation to enhance cyber infrastructure across our higher education system. With this award, both intra and inter campus connectivity, research and education are being improved, both here at Marshall University, at West Virginia University, at smaller institutions throughout the state, our technical colleges, and our K-12 system connectivity. The impact of improved connectivity reaches a broad range of disciplines, from bio-nanoscience to energy to neuroscience to astrophysics, uh, gene therapy and mapping. All of these disciplines can benefit from improved cyber capability. These are crucial areas for our state and require advanced types of nationally funded supercomputing resources that go along with those investigations. Because we are developing strengthened cyber infrastructure in West, West Virginia, our researchers are, have better access than ever before to these high-speed networks around the country. Encompassing these successes is a long-term strategic plan that was developed to guide the expansion of CI beyond the traditional uh, research borders of our larger institutions. This plan really lays the groundwork for CI improvements across the state. The West Virginia Interstate Optical Network, or West Virginia ION, is the foundation of advanced infrastructure and data transport service to the research community. I'd like to recognize Jonathan Caldwell here in the audience, my, my colleague from higher education, who really pulled together many of the CIOs around the state to begin to develop this statewide plan. And of course, Jan Fox here at Marshall, who played uh, another uh, integral role in that process. But this plan really advances data storage and management resources and includes the HPC data storage tools that we need uh, to manage those, those activities and projects funded by the National Science Foundation. And of course, other projects as well. This plan has advanced uh, inter and intra institutional collaboration tools and resources to support and utilize the network and those HPC resources that are made available. The plan also ensures that these tools are sustainable in the future and that we address work plan, workforce issues and economic development at the same time. And while we do not have all of these things in place today, we do not have all the components of this plan and the resources available to us, we are steadily adding capacity uh, throughout the state through these grant activities and through the types of activities that we're talking here today. Actually, it is my hope that you will be discussing the network capacity and the components of it here during today's events, and that you will provide feedback on this network uh, so that we may make continuous improvements now and in the future. And if you are here today and you hear words uh, like Dr. Kopp used about cyber infrastructure, HPC, optical networks, grid computing, 
and some other terms associated with, with these uh, developments. And if you're sitting in your chair right now and you're wondering, you know, just what are some of these things, then you're exactly the audience that needs to be here. You're precisely the people, if some of these terms are a bit confusing or you don't quite know the depth of what some of these components or tools are, then that's really what this event is about. Because as I've said, cyber infrastructure tools empower the entire scientific community and the economic community of our state. Not just in the computer sciences, as some people might think, oh, this is all just about computer science. It is not. Just think as biologists, as chemists, as neuroscientists, and all the different opportunities of massive data analysis and collection, running complex models that really take away the, some of the prototyping that we've had to do in the past, all in a matter of seconds. And, and the computational capacity that may have taken our lifetime to actually do the, uh, do the complete algorithms that we were trying to compute to understand a particular project, that we now can add those tools to the traditional disciplines that may not have really connected to those tools in the past. So West Virginia's academic uh, research community, again, these tools are transformative. <clears throat> and they have really far-reaching effects on how we do science in West Virginia, both now and in the future. And again, this is the future. So if you're learning about these tools and the capabilities for the first time, I'm absolutely delighted that you're here, and I'm delighted that Marshall is hosting this event today. So in closing, let me, uh, let me again thank Marshall University, in particular for your leadership in cyber infrastructure. Without question, Marshall has led the way to advancing tools, connectivity, uh, visualization capacity, and, and many of the other aspects of cyber in West Virginia. I recall a, uh, a discussion uh, with Jan Fox. She and I were uh, sitting in a downtown restaurant here in Huntington several years ago and talking about how we might be able to do this, both from a state perspective and from the leadership here at Marshall. And I have to congratulate Jan on bringing Internet 2 to this campus, uh, and she has done just that. So thanks again, Jan. Uh, uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Tony Swilski, uh, uh, Betsy Doolin, and the people in the engineering department who have been really a focal point of the work on, on many of these grants. And overall, thank you for the leadership of Marshall University. Thank you. Uh, well, this time it's a great pleasure to welcome back our keynote speaker, Selby Wellman. Uh, as most of you already know of his uh, certainly rich technology and entrepreneurial experience, and also his generous spirit. I've, the few years, I don't know how many years I've actually uh, known you, Selby, but even this morning during the coffee break, he was asking me, uh, how we were doing with Incensus, <coughs> which is some rail technology uh, that we have developed with Richard Begley and uh, in, within RTI. Uh, so Selby still <coughs> remembers that and still has a great deal of, of, of interest, and, and we really appreciate that. <coughs> Selby is the uh, um, retired senior vice president of Cisco Systems. Uh, prior to Cisco, he was vice president of sales, marketing at Fibercom. And prior to that, he was corporate uh, VP of sales marketing um, at Paradigm Corporation. Uh, he, in fact, started his career at IBM. He also, uh, within that career, he spent five years as an officer in the Air Force. Uh, since his retirement, if you can call it that, he's been extremely busy. He's, uh, his activities include a director of Red Hat, Lulu Enterprises, Lulu Limited, and he is the owner of a Caroline, the Carolina Railhawks, which is a professional soccer team. And of course, uh, Selby is an alumni of Marshall University. Uh, the title of Selby's presentation today is The Future of the Internet. Selby? Tony asked me to talk to you a little bit about the future of the Internet. <clears throat> And having uh, uh, left Cisco about uh, a decade ago, about 10 years ago, 
I said, well, wait a minute, you know, I don't give many talks anymore. Tony kept after me and so forth, and I said, okay, I'll sit down. I made a few notes and started thinking about the future of the Internet. And, and all of a sudden, I realized that <clears throat> when I was at Cisco, I was much more uh, focused on the technology, the speeds, the reads, the feeds, the network strength, and our, our products and things like that. But over the last decade, I really now have taken on the role of an end user. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so therefore, a user of the Internet, I have a different perspective, and, and, and I'd like to share with you some of that today. To do that, I'll do a very quick review of the, of the past, because any time you look at a future, you've got to take a quick glimpse of the past to see where it might be headed. And I'll do a little quick review of that, and I'll spend most of my time talking about the uh, challenges of the Internet, too. I'll share with you and what I see and how we have to solve some of those problems going forward. Let me take you back to, uh, back to the Cisco days. It's really kind of recognized, despite the fact that the Internet was out there in the early 80s, mostly in the government, about 1994 is about the first time you started to see the commercial use and some of the possibilities. And I was at Cisco at the time. And so at that particular time, if you look at it from the standpoint of, of where it was, all technology, when it's new, it tends to stay kind of and, and dawdle along for a while, okay, while some of the research is going on and things like that to take place. And then there's some events that tend to make that technology take off. And that's exactly what happened at Cisco. We had a, a tagline at Cisco back, back in those days, and I think it still is a tagline as I see John's talk from time to time, about that we really believe the inter internet would impact how we work, live, learn, and play. Emphasis mostly was on work because we could see the tremendous productivity advantages of getting rid of paper inside of our company and the rest of the companies around the world. So the first thing we did at Cisco is we implemented that because we felt that if we were going to go out and be evangelists for that concept, we ought to be able to show people that we did it. So we literally eliminated paper back in those days and used the internet for it all the way through our supply chain, okay, so that everything moved fast and we were productive. And therefore, it, it helped us, of course, obviously with our stock price and our costs and so forth. But that really was the time back in those days that it was very early and it really was just kind of growing at a kind of a steady pace. And then all of a sudden, with that concept of work, live, learn, and play, and some of those things started to come in, the Internet took off throughout the rest of the 90s, as you know, and it was known as the Internet boom years, okay? So <clears throat> what I see coming up to here where we are today, you know, we're still at a, at a uh, point in thing. I'd like to share with you, though, something that even back in 1994, and there's a point to this, th what did we not see? at Cisco. We did not see things like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, ebook, blocks, and media transformation. We didn't see this media transformation of the newspapers to our iPads. All right? And that has changed that entire industry. I start my day every day when I get my cup of coffee. I have my iPad and I have Wall Street Journal, New York Times, no matter where I go. All right? And that's the transformation I'm talking about. We didn't see those things. So what, my point I'm trying to make is what you may see today doesn't necessarily point out to the whole future. There's a lot more coming out there. And so the goal of my presentation and the time I spend with you today, I'll try to share with you some of those things that are going on all right, in terms of where it's headed. Back in 1994, these are actual comments made by people that I traveled around the world when we were out preaching about Cisco and the Internet actual comments made. The internet networks, they're a passing fad. Right? They were all private networks back in those days, dominated by the IBM Corporation. It was not an open network like the internet. Oh, it won't happen. That came from an IBM executive, by the way. All right? And they missed the boat. They did because of that. Their executives couldn't see the internet coming, and they ended up having to get out of the networking business when the internet kind of took over. So I'm trying to just look at some of that. I won't go through these, but just just as you scan through them, you can see there were a lot of naysayers out there about where the Internet could be back in 1994. Look at it today. All right? That's what, about 15 years, 16 years? Two billion users, that's a third of the world's population, use the Internet today. Two billion videos watched per day on YouTube. Three billion email accounts. 107 billion spent on advertising just last year. Remember that comment? Oh, we'll never see people spend money to advertise on the Internet back in 1994. 
and look at some of these comments as you go through with this and look at the 65% of adults under 30 get their news from the internet. In, in 2007, that number was 34%. So in about three years, three and a half years, it's doubled. All right, so what's that tell you about the growth of the internet and where it's headed? A couple of other interesting facts. Lady Gaga has 7.7 .7 million followers, okay? <laughs> and you remember Charlie Sheen, who I think needs an intervention of some type, but uh, he set the record, all right, for 25, uh, reaching 1 million followers in 25 hours. Now, is those things important? No, not really to me personally. But all I'm trying to point out by showing you this is look at the change that has taken place over the last 15, 16 years. And what you and I can obviously say that the next 15 or 16 years, there's going to be even more dramatic change. And again, we'll talk about some of those ideas. Talk about the future of the Internet. There it is. Any questions? <laughs> That's it. That's all that technology. One of my favorite expressions, though, comes from Yogi Berra. The future ain't what it used to be. Think about that for a moment, okay? I see Bobby Pruitt back there. He's used to some of my expressions, and he says, why'd you say that, Selby? Okay? All right, here's the same chart, looking at 2011, and let's look at it 2020. I believe that we are right here now, even though we've had that massive growth of, of the Internet, okay, I believe that we're in kind of a lull right now. There's a lot going on out there. And so what is that next big technology wave going to be that's going to make this thing grow just like it did over the last 15 years? Well, certainly the work, live, learn, and play concept that we're all used to, how it impacts our lives and so forth, a lot of that will continue. But I have a theory on what I think that's all, it's going to be all about that's going to account for this next large growth. And it has to do with this. I believe the real opportunity is to make the world much better and certainly much safer. And that's a whole different concept of work, live, learn, and play that I'm going to try to talk to you about, about how it can make our lives better and certainly make us safer all, right, all around the world. There are five what I call enabling technologies that will drive this concept of making it a much better place for us and a much safer place. First of all, video. Video is, is off and running. All right, and it, it, it's all about this face-to-face. -face. Cisco has this thing called telepresence. If, anything, if you've ever had the opportunity to sit in a room and have a video conference with people in Japan and all over the world you, in HD quality real time, it's quite an experience. It's just like they're in the room. And, that, and they also have it at the home today, a thing called UMI, which stands for you and me. It's expensive, and those prices will come down over time. But what you're going to see is this face-to-face. I have, I'm an iPhone user. I have a granddaughter out in San Diego, California. My son out there has an iPhone, and it has a little old feature on there that when we call, we can both agree to hit face talk, and we can talk on my iPhone, and I can see her. That's just, just the beginning. But this whole video revolution will continue in terms of impacting and making our lives better. All right, I can't recall when I was a young salesman for IBM back in the days with no cell phones or anything at all like that, I can't imagine how many more sales calls and appointments I could have made if I had capabilities like that. I can make like one or two calls a day. Now salespeople can make 10 or 12 a day, and you'll see the productivity of that and, and as we go forward. There's a whole lot of uh, sensors have been around for a long time. I do believe they're one of the real key enabling technologies in terms of what they can be used for and then get information immediately over the internet to us about what some kind of event that's going on. I also believe over in the GPS side of it, there's a company out there today, a startup company called LightSquared. LightSquared is a part, has partnered with Boeing that uh, put up the largest satellite for wireless broadband, 4G wireless broadband that they're going to put out there and they're going to start in probably this year and then hopefully 2012. They're dealing with the FCC a little bit right now on some issues and so forth. But the whole idea of GPS, RFID tags, radio frequency ID tags, have been around for a long time, but they've never been deployed on a massive scale. And what you're going to see now, that technology is really going to take off. It's, a, it's an RFID tag, just like a barcode that you've seen that was put in place on all the products and our clothes, those things and so forth to identify us, except this is a smart tag. It's got a, chip, a microchip, a little antenna in there, and storage capacity. 
So think about that for a moment in terms of what it could be. And certainly the wireless revolution will continue with the, you see these pictures of these cell towers all around the countryside. Let me speak a little bit more detail about the wireless broadband, the whole thing that's developing there, this anytime, anywhere concept. Look at it today. By 2013, there will be 21.6 billion downloads of mobile apps coming up in the next couple of years. 18 times of the, of the number of smartphones out there. How many path people have smartphones? Look around the room. I'm thinking that's probably 80 some percent already, okay? And we're going to have 18 times that by 2015, okay? Think about the impact when you have 30x more wireless times of the data traffic, all right, and the usage. This comes right out of Bell Labs, and you say, wow, that's a lot of wireless. The bottom line today is the demand for wireless broadband far exceeds the supply. Got to change that. How are we changing it? Well, one way that I've noticed they're changing it, it's called a light radio cube. This is being developed in the Bell Labs, uh, which is uh, owned, uh, you know, of course, by Alcatel Lucent. And they're going to roll this out uh, and for tests this year and then uh, put it in production for 2012. I had a little visual aid here I wanted to share with you. That's a Rubik's Cube that you all know, but that light radio cube you're looking at is about that exact size. What is it? It's a wireless, okay? In the labs today that they're going to run the test on, it has a two block radius. They believe that with further development of this technology, this will replace cell towers. Now think about that for a moment, okay? First of all, the, the, the uh, side of the environment where we don't have those 300 foot ugly towers all over the country. We can put these anywhere. Just think about setting it here. Okay? And think about my iPhone, think about my iPad, think about wireless. The possibilities are enormous of what that could mean to us in terms of the development of technology going forward. They'll roll this out. It works. Uh, I think it has tremendous implications in terms of one of the enabling, key enabling technologies that we'll see going forward. Now, uh, I recognize the, the audience is very diverse in terms of your background, and I apologize to some of the more advanced uh, technology people here. I'm going to drop way back to Internet 101 for a moment, and I want to introduce a concept that I'd like you to tuck up in memory and keep it there while I walk you through some examples of what I'm going to be talking about in terms of the future of the Internet. We're all familiar. You can't imagine the, the amount of data that's out here in the Internet today. You all, I'm sure, can, can bear witness to that. It's just enormous. Anything you want to know practically. But what we've been doing over here in the last 15 years is called the pull push. Mostly what we do is we're on a computer and we want something and want to know something from the Internet, so we enter it. All right? And then it comes back to us. So that's a pull push effect. Okay? I want to pull something down, then they push it down to me at my request. Over here on this side of it, which is the big concept I want to introduce to you, that's a very thin line today because things get pushed down to us, not necessarily things we want. Spam. I didn't ask for that. Okay? Here it comes. It's on my internet, on my PC, and so forth. So, technology wise, and the push effect technology-wise, we do ask for certain things like alert me on a stock. When my stock goes up a certain percentage, send me an alert. It pushed it to me. I didn't ask for it. I just set it up to let me know. So technology from a push standpoint is already there. But applying it in a lot more different kinds of means is what's really going to be the driver of this Internet technology curve I'm talking about in the next 8 to 10 years. There are going to be a lot more push to us when we want to know something, we didn't ask for it, or more importantly, we need to know something that we didn't ask for. And so the application growth is what will drive that concept. So as I said, keep that up in memory for a moment, uh, because as I walk through some examples, I'm going to do it by industry, uh, you, you'll kind of understand technology that's certainly doable. Let's talk about education first, uh, something I've been involved with for some time. It, it boils down to that facts are that virtual classrooms do work. So the ability to get the education here versus this massive university and what they see is basically the same. It does work. And so, in fact, we can teach classes in a virtual, virtual mode. 
Now let me tell you what I think about this concept about education and why I think it will be tremendous in terms of what's happening out there today. And we're even seeing this signs and it'll get even more so. I believe that with the use of the internet and the fact that our children and our students all right, use the internet, all right, it allows them to think for themselves. Let me give you one example. It's, it's a little bit of an old example, but it's a little personal for me. The Vietnam War, many of you students don't even remember that, but some of you certainly will. Back in the days of, uh, it was about a 12 year war, and it was very controversial. That, and it was just a massive problem in our country. We had killings at Kent State and violent and protests, et cetera, and so forth. So the whole history of the Vietnam War, when the students, if you were my students and I was teaching you verbally like this about the Vietnam War, there'd be a chapter on it in your textbook. You would read it. Whoever wrote that textbook had an opinion, and that would be in the textbook. I, as your professor or instructor, I would have my opinion, and I'd share that with you if we were doing it the old school way. But the new way is that what we can do now is we can assign a student, all right, I'd like you to go and do the research on the Vietnam War on the internet, and I'd like you to form your own opinion. Think for yourself. And that's just one example of what I think is really going to revolutionize education. It, it allows our students to get many, many more thoughts. In that particular example, they could go and watch videos of General Westmoreland. They could watch LBJ talk about it. They could form their own opinion, not necessarily that of one particular instructor, professor, or in a particular textbook. So that little old concept, when exploded, okay, to me, is transforming into education because that's what our kids need to do. They need to learn to think for themselves, okay? And that's where the value of education really plays importance in terms of the uh, internet. And that will continue, of course, to, to expand greatly. Healthcare. Healthcare, the, the opportunities in healthcare are, are off the chart. Telemedicine. Telemedicine where I can literally send MRIs and x-rays and, and all that. I've even seen examples of where robotics, uh, some particular surgeon, say over in Europe, can do surgery somewhere in Africa, okay, and direct the robotics without physically being there. Think about the possibilities of that. Also think about it as done over the internet and the bandwidth that, that uh, President Kopp talked about the required. So that'll be a huge amount of growth in that particular area. Electronic medical records. Well, it turns out, and, and by the way, congratulations to Jan and all of you that were involved when I heard about how you connected all three of these hospitals together. That's phenomenal. Do you realize that there are 5,000 hospitals in the country and there's only about 1% of them that are doing electronic medical records and you're here doing it? Think about that for a moment. And think about the concept when you and I can have all of our records digitally all right, available. I lived down in Naples in the winter. I had to go to the doctor about three or four weeks ago. They didn't know me from Adam, okay, at all. And it sure would have been nice if they could have got on the terminal and went to Duke and found out all my medical records. I would really have enjoyed that. Think about the impact when we can do that universally, all right? And matter of fact, get access to where we are in terms of healthcare. Smart hospitals, uh, again, use sensors in hospitals. There's a hospital that I'm aware of that has sensors on every hospital room, all right? And as soon as a particular, be it a nurse or a doctor, walks through that door, it identifies them and puts the picture up and tells them their name in terms of the patient looking at who they are. All right? And they have all of those kinds of things in place for that. Emergency transport, all right, down here. Well, uh, something happens to you or someone and they get thrown in an ambulance. All right? What do you know about that person? They don't know a whole heck of a lot. But with electronic medical records and wireless in the ha ambulance and doctors and so forth available, they can immediately tell that's good old Shelby and he's had a heart attack, okay? And we better, this is what he's allergic to. Don't do any of these kinds of things. So think about that again in terms of the internet giving you the capability to do that. Here's a real live one that's going on today. This is OxyContin. OxyContin happens to be the most widely uh, stolen drug, all right, across our country, okay? Pfizer, who makes it, are putting RFID labels on those boxes now. They're replacing the UPC code, so they're putting intelligence on that container. What will that allow them to do? They'll always know where that particular container is, all right, wirelessly, and they can track it. 
And so what will that do in terms of maybe keeping some of those out of the wrong hands? It'll have a lot to do with it. And also from an RFID device, what's this have to do when you start putting them on grocery stores and things like that in terms of productivity all right, for those kind of uh, uh, applications as well? This is one of my favorites because I, as an American citizen, uh, certainly remember 9-11 vividly and I track it and I worry about it every day in terms of our world and what's going on with terrorism. So I'd like you to just take a little trip with me for a moment and look at, whoops, back up here, and look at this. Let's pretend for a moment that this is setting on a light pole. It's got a sensor in it. It's got a camera in it, okay? And I can wirelessly go over there with my uh, light radio cube and about every two blocks I can put them out there, okay, all over a city, okay? What's that mean? Well, let me give you an example, a real life example. The research is being done at Stanford as we speak. It's been going on for four or five years and they're getting very, very close to where they're developing a sensor that, will, that can be put out here and it can detect the molecules in the air. Turns out that these, these characters that try to bomb us and so forth, they're not that sophisticated. So when they put their bombs together, where it's a bomb on them or they're carrying it or it's a suitcase of WMD or whatever, it turns out those molecules will leak out of there and they get out in the air. And we're now going to have sensors that can detect that and a camera in there. Now think about this for a moment. Where would that individual be going with that bomb? Maybe they're going to a subway. But now I can detect it. I can take a picture of them and wirelessly I could go all the way through and I could shut down that subway, all right, and I could pinpoint that person and we, get, we could notify the police and go out and maybe prevent that. Maybe we can't prevent that person from who's, who's carrying a, a bomb on himself to, to uh, let it go off right there. But I surely could prevent him from getting into that subway and killing thousands. Okay? That's just one example. All right? Think about our ports over here. Probably our most biggest exposure in terrorism, right? We don't have the ability with all the goods that come in on our ports all over, the, all over the United States today, or for that matter, around the world. Picture having RFID tags on all of the process, you know, requiring that when they come into our country so I can identify what's in that container. Picture that in some of those containers, then I can have sensors that can detect anything that's gone wrong in there, okay? And then I can inspect that wirelessly without having people to go out and check all those containers. I can do it over a computer with my uh, centralized control of it. And then it can alert me that says, you know, in container four, all right, doesn't, doesn't quite feel right to me, go out there and look at it, all right. Those things, by the way, this is not Buck Rogers kinds of things. These are things that are being done today, but they're in the very early stages. And as we get that technology ironed out, that'll account for this another wave of growth that I'm speaking to. Talk about border monitoring, sensors, cameras, same thing. What about crime? This is very interesting to me. Crime. 81 people die every day in our country by gunshots. It's one every 18 minutes. Every 10 days a policeman is killed. Gunshots and our guns and so forth, that accounts for the most serious crimes that we have. There's a company called uh, Spot Shooter that has detection equipment today that can detect that a gunshot went off, okay? So today, people don't report it or maybe they report it late or whatever with sensors out there and things like that and maybe even cameras too, I can detect that gunshot. Now maybe I can't stop the first round or two going off, but if I could wirelessly go all the way through and I wouldn't have to go back to some central site here, I could go wirelessly all the way through and I'm through a GPS, I can detect where that closest police officer is and I can move him to that direction. Possibly I might start saving some lives that way. And certainly I could solve crimes faster that way. So the impact of some of these technologies I'm talking about, satellite, RFID devices and sensors, again, are gonna account for a lot of that growth. This makes life safer. Not only better, but a lot safer for us that I've been speaking to. Well, internet voting. That day will come. That day will come, okay? 39% of the people voted in the 2008 election, yet 77% of us have internet access. 
interesting statistic. Okay? The real inhibitor, of course, is identification. But I will tell you that some of the research I've studied and read about and heard about in the world of biometrics, in terms of facial recognition, iris and the lens, fingerprinting and things like that, we'll solve that problem. We really will. All right? And I know it's still in the early stages and we've got a lot of work to do, but I've watched technology over my past four decades and I can tell you, I, every time you think that, uh, gee, they'll never solve that problem, they do. All right? And we've got a lot of research going on in that area as well. But that day will come, in my opinion, that we will be able to, all of a sudden, 80 and 90 percent of us will vote, okay, if we can p go on that uh, little smartphone and uh, do it, and we get recognized to who we are, that we really are a valid vote. Another big area is uh, energy management and the environment, <clears throat> which talks about uh, smart homes, home energy systems, smart meters in the homes, all the way up to the smart grids. For example, uh, one of my favorite things is that in our homes today, you and I, all right, we're creatures of our habit. Let's be honest, okay? Uh, if it's hot and it's the summer, we'll keep the air on 72 and then we'll go to work. And maybe if it's a, a split family in the home, it'll stay on 72 all day long, right? What you really want to do and can be done today and is being done today, I can go on my cell phone, all right? I can turn it up to about 78. And then when I get in my car to go home, I can, I can go turn that meter on back to 72 so it's comfortable when I get in. What happened in that eight, 10 hours I was gone in terms of savings for me personally? And what happened to the impact of the grid itself? Savings of power and things like that, okay? So that's just one example. And you're gonna see smart appliances too, all right? And this whole concept of all the way from home energy, smart meters to the smart grid. Let me give you one statistic to grab onto. Turns out that if you could make our grids in America 5% more efficient, just 5% through this concept I just shared with you, just 5%, that's the equivalent of the fuel and the emission gases from 53 million cars. Just 5%. And again, the internet's going to give us that capability to reach that goal. Retail industry, electronic payment systems. Well, you know, this is another big area, and by the way, it's happening now. I just flew up here, <clears throat> and I had my boarding pass here, okay? Walked right up, they scanned it, and I got on the plane. That's an example of the electronic payment systems and wallets that we're going to be using nowadays. Uh, you think this technology's new? Well, I can tell you that over in Japan, They've been using electronic wallets for uh, probably about eight or nine years over there now. They literally walk up to a Coke machine and point their cell phone, all right? The Coke comes out and it takes it out of their checking account and pays for it. No cash, okay? You'll see all kinds of things like that going on. Matter of fact, Star this is Starbucks. They have it under test right now that you don't have to go stand in line. You can walk in, sit down, take your seat at Starbucks, order your latte, okay, pay for it, and when they call your number, go and get it, okay? Walmart. Jan and I were talking about this before. What's, what's going to make electronic uh, payments and wallets take off and things like that? Well, the technology's there. Why hasn't it taken off? Generally, what you'll find is that in that slow part of the curve I talked about, the thing that kicks it in and makes it go is some kind of a large event. In this particular case, what I believe that big event is going to be is Walmart, all right? Walmart has now dictated, a very large company, and they can dictate, they have dictated that if you want to sell product through my distribution chain called my Walmart stores, you will put an RFID device on every single thing you sell to me by the year 2016. That is going to be revolutionary. Now, let's talk for a second about why would Walmart do that. Well. Think about it. Think about the concept, why is Walmart? Are they doing this for the human good or whatever? No, they're do, doing it to save money and expenses. Okay, why? Well, with an RF8, RFID device on the shelves of Walmart, all right, whenever something comes off that shelf, I know that it's gone. And therefore, I know the inventory level. And when I consolidate that all around all my Walmart stores, I know exactly how many products to go buy from that supplier. I know exactly where he should ship them. Okay? I don't have to have people walking around with scanners, all right, 
trying to figure it out and then sending up a report store by store any longer. And matter of fact, the second piece of that, once I have an RFID device on all my equipment, all of my things in the store, what you can do is you pull it off there and put it in, the, uh, put it in your uh, uh, case that you're taking away. It automatically uh, counts it for you so you walk out the store. You don't go and get it all checked out through a scanner with a person running it on the scanner. Think about the productivity and what that means to Walmart. And Walmart being a leading retail chain, I believe that is the big event that you and I are going to see all right, going forward in terms of electronic wallets. I can even foresee the day that uh, we don't carry a whole lot of cash around us, with us. I can see the day where I have that smartphone with me and I go out to dinner, all right? And I just, they run it by a scanner and I pay for them. And before they do it, I have a choice. My Visa, my American Express, or maybe I want to pay for it out of my bank account. I just collect and say, I want this to come out of American Express. Whoosh, takes care of it. So that, that, that's just a huge area in terms of what's going on with the internet. Think about the volume now of the retail industry. Think about the volume of traffic that will go over the internet when we start getting around to full use of these kinds of technologies. Here's just an interesting thing about it. Who do you think that the, uh, the uh, future people, what is the future in store? This is fascinating because we, this concept we learned at Cisco is that the moment you think you know who your competitor is, you're in trouble, okay? Because you don't know. It can change overnight, all right, on who your competitor is. For example, the, of what I just talked about with electronic wallets, you naturally think of Visa and MasterCard, American Express, all right, banks, but what about Apple? Could Apple be a bank? What do we buy on Apple today through iTunes? Books, music, they've got the technology there. They could be a bank, okay? So quite frankly, there is a race underway. Matter of fact, uh, Google, all right, over here, they're involved with some tests of uh, mobile payment systems, all right, with um, I think it's uh, Citibank and Microsoft are all combining together to put this together. And they're all in a horse race. I like horse races because when people have horse races, the best technology usually wins and it goes faster. And that's what's going on out there today. So if you're a Microsoft executive or a Google or Apple, I guarantee you they're thinking about this, okay? Or about moving that and getting that volume over them, all right? Because it's a business decision. So again, electronic wallets are certainly in our future. They're here today. Transportation, another big one. Jan and I were talking about this a little early. Turns out that, uh, you know, about 80% of all of the emission gases come from the city. All right, we got 50% of the world's population, I believe, lives in large cities and so forth. Just one little statistic, we waste 3.7 billion hours and we burn 2.3 billion gallons of fuel sitting in traffic each year just in the United States. And Jan was telling me how they do this in Cincinnati, so every time she drives down there, she immediately all right, goes into this web application and finds out what's the best route to go to dodge all that traffic. And they're doing that all, right, all around the country. So you're going to see in, uh, a lot of development in this particular area which I think has a tremendous impact on the environment to say nothing of the application and making it better for us to travel and not to have to deal with those problems and so forth. Stockholm down here is a smart city. They, uh, and, and by the way, just in case you think some of all of this is all being developed and pushed in the United States, that's not true. Just like Japan paying for things out of a Coke machine eight or nine years ago, and we're just now getting around to it. In Stockholm, which uh, about, I think it's about 60% of the city is just about one meter above sea level. They got a lot of levees over there, okay? All right, and they have a lot of traffic and so forth too. But they now have GPS, they have sensors on their roads, they have GPS in all their vehicles, all right? And now they can, all their people that are traveling in Stockholm can tell exactly where the traffic patterns are and they can direct them to take another route if they want to move a little faster and so forth. Already being done. So it's not, this is not Buck Rogers technology you say we'll coming. No, it's here. And it will come to our U.S. cities. Matter of fact, in Cincinnati, you say it's already there. Rider, by the way, over here. Here's a good example over here. Here's a rider truck. Uh, rider uh, leases trucks out a lot. And they're making these trucks smart. They're putting uh, sensors in here that can detect the temperature and the humidity. All right? 
and then you have RFID devices on the packages themselves. Okay, so they can detect where that truck is at all time. All right, and they can control the temperature in there. All right, without the, relying on the truck driver himself to do it and so forth. I'll show you another example of that where that applies in just a second. Another one is catastrophe uh, prevention. Uh, if you recall a few years back about the bridge that collapsed up in Minnesota, and then what came out of that was a study by the government that, oh my goodness, uh, our infrastructure is falling apart all across the country. Our old bridges are getting old and things like that. Well, what do we do about it? Well, the facts are that with sensors, and we can go out there and monitor some of our bridges out there, and we can detect, just like you detect, Tony, all right, with regard to your, uh, your railroad underneath and how the tra track's weakening. We can go out and detect at the land movement of all of our bridges, and we can maybe figure out in advance which ones are getting weaker, all right, so that we can go out and fix them first as opposed to, to do it. So all that monitoring of all of our infrastructure over the Internet with sensors, all right, very definitely a possibility. Let's go back to the Netherlands, for example. Here, uh, by the way, I said Stockholm. It's really Netherlands. Netherlands uh, is the one that has about 50 or 60 percent uh, of their, po of their uh, city is only one meter above sea level. And working with IBM, they've put together a very, very robust sensory network that constantly monitors those levees, all right, and how weak they may be coming or a potential leak and whatever. And I couldn't help but wonder when I read about this, what if we had had that prior to Katrina? Would Katrina have happened? Maybe not. So again, what, what can we do with sensors and devices like that that can help us in terms of preventing these catastrophes? Food supply. Interesting statistic for you. In the United States alone, we throw away $48 billion per year of food between the grocers and, and us as consumers. Why do we do that? It's out of date, all right, and it's spoiled or whatever. So if you look at this just in this example of this carrot, it goes from Iowa, it travels 1,600 miles from California to get over here. So what you're seeing is that the internet can be used very effectively in the food supply chain because with RFID devices, sensors in the, in the vehicles themselves, like that rider truck I shared with you, I can track, all right, those goods all along the road and even down to the point where if I have an RFID reader in my refrigerator, it'll notify me that it's out of date, don't eat it, all along the road. And furthermore, if there were problems, which we all, every year we hear about an outbreak of some food problems and things like that, now with those RFID devices tracking it all the way, we can go back and much quicker figure out what happened. And if I'm a, a supplier and so forth, I get pretty excited about this because what I can do, I can track it on the truck, I can keep it in a truck that's got sensors that monitors the temperature and the humidity, and I can send alerts back to my home office that says, you know what, truck number 42, he's in Iowa, and, he, and he's behind schedule, and I could get in touch with him and say, get back on schedule, I gotta get it, to, I gotta get it to market before we run out of time. So again, the internet doing things that we've never thought about before in terms of how we make life better for us and certainly we make it safer in many, many different ways, okay? So I've gone through some examples on this in terms of what I think, but let me give you a couple of other things to think about. President Obama, okay, uh, and this is not a political statement, trust me, it's just a fact, all right? How did we elect him? He was a junior senator. He'd been in the Senate two years, and about one year of that he spent, uh, you know, trying to run, thinking about president, the state legislature, and we elected him president. Certainly he was a great orator, all right, and certainly his, his message of change and hope resonated with the American public, but the facts are, all right, that he had someone on his staff, his name was Chris Hughes. Anybody, does that ring a bell to anybody? He's 24 years old at the time. Uh, he was one of the founders of Facebook. He was the architect of Obama's internet, all right, uh, use of Facebook and everything to get his name out there, promote it, and more importantly, collect money. Obama raised $750 million in his campaign. Half of it came over the internet. And by the time Hillary Clinton and McCain figured it out, it was just too late, okay? He just ran right by him. So think about the internet transforming the world. 
Look down here at something, a very recent event over in Japan of the, of the uh, tsunami. Can't prevent the tsunami, of course. But if you followed that at news uh, media and reports on it, they gave credit to the internet and the use of social media, all right, in terms of advance of saving a lot of lives. They lost a lot, but they saved a lot because of the internet. Okay? Recognize this one? Egypt? Who's that guy? He's vice president of Google. He was able to bring down an entire regime with his laptop and social media. Internet transforming the world. So, future of the internet, I believe it has the potential to make our lives and the world much better as our planet becomes more instrumented with RFID and sensory and the GPS and the connections and so forth. The result, I believe it will be more intelligent. And I believe, as I said before, we are on the brink of another major growth of the internet because of applications like this and those enabling technologies. There are some challenges and inhibitors. I won't talk about these. I'm running short of time, but you can read them, but they're out there. Like any other technology, there's going to be problems. There's going to be inhibitors. There's going to be bumps in the road, and we've got to get over those. The research funding. Sometimes the implementation is, uh, it takes too long. Number three, internet content is difficult to control. One of my pet peeves, I don't like some of the stuff that's on the internet. I was over with Terry Finger yesterday at the Forensic Science Center who's got a project now, he's been underway for some time and he's just expanded it into digital forensics right here at Marshall University. Outstanding. You know why? They can track child pornographers and boy do I like that. All right? And they can figure out who they are and they can get a warrant and get them arrested. All right? So we will solve these problems with some of the bad stuff that's on the internet is my point. Okay? Security and privacy, again, biometrics, watch all the development there. We'll solve that security problem as we go forward. Government regulation, please be careful. Don't hold us up. As Jan was telling me how long it took with this hospital with the FCC and all the paperwork and all that. Please, they've got to, they just got to move faster. Dan, where are you? You guys have got to work on this in West Virginia. Make things move faster, all right, when you see these ideas and keep West Virginia out leading on some of these things. And then, of course, our ever-popular resistance to change. I used to give a lot of talks about this, and I still worry about it because it's a huge, huge problem for us. Our K-12 system is still broken, and it needs fixed. Why? Because those are the math and science kids. They need to be motivated when they come to Marshall to study these technologies and participate in this next wave of growth. And if we aren't getting enough of them, we won't get enough of those entrepreneurs and those young people thinking about how they come up with these ideas. Look at, look at uh, Facebook and Google. These are 20-year-olds found in these companies, okay? They're the ones that come up with these fresh ideas, all right? So we've really got to continue to work on that. I worry about that being our largest inhibitor to this, by the way, that we don't have enough in China and India and the rest of the world. They're putting out graduates of engineers and the technology things much faster than we are. That has a direct uh, concern to me. Very quickly. U.S. economic cycles has always been something like this. We invent almost everything. We do. And then competition comes along. We have to drop our price. I run a company, so I've got to be concerned about my profits and my stock. Eventually, I go do manufacturing overseas. My jobs go over there, and I lose my jobs here. We've been on that economic cycle for several decades now. Okay? And that's just how it works. China and India, we've probably heard, you're probably sick and tired of hearing about China and India and what they're doing in education how fast their economies are growing and things like that. And, and certainly that's all true. But the biggest thing I worry about with China and India is that because of what's happening with their education system, they are now starting their companies over there. They used to come over here and start them and they'd come to our universities and then go and stay here and work. But now they're going back because the opportunities in China and India are greater for startup companies with technology. And here's what I, my point I'd like to make. If, if we ever lose our technology edge in terms of being creative and inventing and doing the research, and we lose that to China and India, we'll break the economic cycle. We won't be on the front end of it anymore. We'll be on the back end. And I really worry about that one because I have grandchildren now, and I don't want them to have to go through that, losing our, our edge in high tech. And by the way, I say the same thing about biotech. Those two industries, we cannot lose our edge, all right, in terms of continuing to invent it create jobs and so forth and keep our economy on the cycle it should be. There's a lot of people in Washington talking about doom and gloom, that U.S. is on the brink. 
We're $14 trillion in debt. <clears throat> China just about owns us, things like that. And I do worry about that as well, but I don't believe that we're on the brink. Sure, we've got some of those problems, but just to my comment that I just made, that if we lose our edge in terms of high tech and biotech and our ability to research and create new environment, new things and, and, and new jobs to go along with it, then we will be on the brink. That's my bigger fear than the $14 trillion of debt. All right? And so what we have to do is we have to embrace, foster, fun, and cheer for this next wave of the internet connection. Some of the, I just touched on a few of the applications. We want to keep going like that as fast as we can. And that's the subject of your meeting today with the cyber infrastructure. I like Peter Drucker's comment, the best way to predict the future, all right, is to create it. And that's what we need to continue to do in the country. And you're doing a lot of that here at Marshall and West Virginia, and it's just very gratifying to come back and see that. So uh, President Kopp defined cyber infrastructure, the heart of what you're going to be talking about today, and it's all going to be doing over the Internet. So what I would encourage all of you is to take special interest about the cyber infrastructure. Those are the tools that you need to create these applications that creates that next technology wave that I've been talking about. It is a pleasure coming back to Marshall. Thank you very much. Time for two questions. Two questions. And we have a <coughs> microphone there. Two questions. Yeah. Over here? John? So the, uh, with the growth of the internet and its penetration into society, what work needs to be done to improve its sort of robustness and redundancy as it gets into our the inner workings of our lives and we're going to depend upon it to eat and to heat our homes, you know, mm -hmm. what we need to be doing to ensure the, uh, the sort of robustness of it. Okay, good question. Uh, hopefully my former boss, John, is doing a lot about the infrastructure in terms of duplication and things like that. that that's a big, big issue that we had to face at Cisco. It's not a matter of me connecting up point A and point B, but as you point out, I need to keep A and B running. So between the internet service providers and doing all that duplication and redundancy, is clearly where they're headed. I think, but I, matter of fact, if I were to look at the internet today versus a decade ago, it's a heck of a lot more reliable than it used to be. And I think there's continued work that'll always be going on there as well. And then I also believe that as we uh, uh, get to the smart grid effect, quite frankly, I had a brownout over at my house in Huntington this morning. I think when we get more better at the smart grid technology so that if there is a problem here before it takes down the power, I can pull another power source in to prevent that from happening. So all kinds of things. Very good question. Uh, again, it's like technology, any all other technology, it will continue to evolve, okay? Uh, I'm old enough to know that when I used to pick up a telephone landline, it, it, it uh, may not work, those kinds of things. I also know my cell phone doesn't work all the time. But I also know that when things like the satellite and this wireless broadband and all those kinds of things and redundancy build into it, they'll solve those problems. Question? Very much enjoyed your uh, presentation, Selby. Thank you. Uh, if you extrapolate from what's happening with publishing industries, and you talk about newspapers, books, uh, what have you, and the digitization and now the electronic applications that are replacing uh, you know, the print copy. Right. And you look at what's happening to the uh, audio industry you know, with now downloads as opposed to CDs or DVDs and so on in terms of rentals, you can just go and download it. Right. If you go to the, the electronic wallet concept and begin extrapolating what that may mean in the near or out term, you begin to start thinking in terms of what does that do to the banking industry as we know it and how does that re get reshaped. And then you get to a very interesting question and that is the Department of the Treasury and, and the U.S. government and to what extent will it influence the need to print currency. I actually had that in my notes and I, I dodged it uh, because it's pretty controversial, isn't it? But the facts are that I really could see that. I may, not be, I may not live to see it. Certainly these young kids in the back probably will get to the point where we may not use money anymore. Uh, when you go to Tokyo and people like that, because they're so advanced with electronic wallets, they don't carry money around. Okay. 
and I believe it will have a profound impact on the banks. Uh, if the banks, uh, traditionally banks have been slow to adopt a lot of things. As if you line up all the industries are at the bottom. And I believe that uh, you'll see a lot of banks disappear <clears throat> because a lot of these uh, uh, payment systems and so forth, I won't need a bank anymore. Okay? But yes, I do see in the next 10 or 15 years, we just may not need cash anymore. I agree. Yes, sir? How are you doing? Uh, Bill Rosenberger from Herald Dispatch. Hi, hey, Bill. Us. Yes. Uh, I wonder, with all this technology and uh, what we saw in Japan and Katrina, uh, if we have a catastrophe and our infrastructure is down, we've got no cash, we've got no communication. <laughs> I, I want, I, I'm concerned that our kids are going to grow up and face challenges that, uh, of communication that they've never experienced before. There's always a risk in that, okay, when you're using technology. And by the way, as a, a related thing, in terms of a, a grandfather now, one of the other things I worry about too, I don't want us to get too dependent on that technology. This face-to-face -face like you and I are talking right now is still the backbone of how things get done, really. Okay, so I don't want to go too overboard with that. Uh, in terms of the, your question, though, directly about the, uh, the dangers of it and the failures of it, back to the comment about the infrastructure redundancy, those will get built out. Cisco, for example. Cisco is a $40 billion company with uh, 63,000 employees right now. Uh, their, their mere existence requires that they, they spend a lot of time developing the research on redundancy and fail-safe types of systems. So th again, I just think that'll happen. Side comment. Uh, do you all remember the scare of 2000? Remember that one? Okay. The world is going to crumble, right, when the date changes. Well. To date myself, I was a programmer back in the late 60s, and I wrote a lot of those uh, software with those dates in there. And I never did understand why they felt that's going to make the, the sky caught fall in. And in fact, it didn't. Okay? Uh, the big scare tactics. So again, you'll hear scare tactics and things as we develop these technologies. I just count on American entrepreneurs and companies like Cisco and the service providers solving those problems as they go along. They have to, to stay in business. Okay. Okay, Selby. Okay, uh, thank you. We, we, we thank you for your unique perspective, your passion. You certainly got held our attention for, for 50 minutes or so. Okay, and good. And we look forward to an update perhaps in the uh, not, not too distant future. Selby, thank you. Thank you.